at the end of last year, a lot of us were doing our presentations, uh, giving us all the more information on our backgrounds and kind of where we came from. Uh, I think this is my third time speaking. First one, I spoke uh, about mechanics liens and stop notices. My second one, we talked about contracts today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more, I guess, about my background and kind of where I came from so you guys can learn a little bit more about me. Um, so I'm born and raised in Orange County. I've lived here my whole life. Um, this, this is my home. I love it here. I know that I'm sure you've all heard somebody say it. Maybe we've all said it that in the last few years, things have changed here. Obviously a lot of political issues, cost of real estate is high. So, you know, said, uh, maybe you got to get out of here, go somewhere else. But at the end of the day, say it, but never leave. I love this place. Uh, you know, 12 months out of the year, we can all wear t-shirts, flip-flop shorts. So to me, it's still the best place, even with the issues that come with it. So uh, again, grew up here. Um, my my family, both of my parents are uh, from Russia, born and raised in Moscow. Uh, side note, they are not Putin lovers. Just want to leave here. Uh, that's why they ran away from Russia, was to get away from all the dictators, which obviously Russia has a long-standing history of dictatorship. Um, so I have no family there anymore, but my parents do have some close friends that are still there and uh, speak to them pretty regularly. And uh, they hate Putin even more than the rest of the world does. So just like most people. Do. But um, my mom came to the United States when she was 15. She came with her entire family, her brother and her parents. My dad came to the United States when he was 17 with no one. Um, his parents didn't come. He said, I'm leaving. I'm uh, seeking the American dream. So he came at 17 by himself didn't speak a word of English, had no money. Um, so obviously super brave move. I, I look up to my parents a lot. Um, so yeah, that, that's, so I'm Russian. I didn't speak a word of English until I was six and I went to school. Um, I, I, I'm fluent in Russian. Obviously as the years go on and I speak more and more English, you forget a few things, but uh, I, I still get by. Um, so my parents being Russian, I think it's in my blood to love ice hockey. Uh, so uh, that's actually the one sport that I've always been passionate about. I've played hockey my whole life. I think my parents put me on skates when I was three years old. Um, so I grew up playing hockey. Uh, side note, my my parents' business, one of the parents' business, they own ice rinks here in Southern California. So it's just like hockey, hockey, hockey. Um, but grew up playing. Uh, I was very competitive. I was uh, not amazing but I was pretty good when I was 16 and a junior in high school I got opportunities to I got recruited by some prep schools in uh, Alberta and British Columbia and in the Midwest uh, to go and play uh, obviously as a 16 year old kid who grew up living and breathing hockey getting that opportunity I wanted nothing more but to go um, that's all I could think about now, I'm sure none of you know this unless you're familiar with hockey, which it's not big out here, so I don't expect you to know any of this, but hockey is a little bit different than uh, like basketball or football, where you go to high school, you play your sport, and then right after high school, you go into college. In hockey, it's pretty rare for a uh, you know somebody 18 years old to be able to play Division One NCAA hockey. The average age of a freshman in uh, NCAA Division One hockey is 20 or 21 years old. You really, unless you're a phenom, it happens, but you don't just go from high school into college. There are very few 18 year old freshmen in NCAA Division One college hockey. So the most people, the route they take, they go to prep school, then they play what's called junior hockey. It kind of gets you ready for Division One, uh, and then by the time usually you're 2021, 20, you're a freshman in college playing Division One. Now, again, that was kind of my route and. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we all thought I, I had the potential to go that route, but we all knew I was not going to the NHL. I was not that good. Um, we all knew I, you know, wasn't going to go make millions of dollars playing hockey, unfortunately. So my mom, uh, school was always a big thing for her. She ingrained it in me. It had to be doing well in school, get your education. So when I came to my mom and said, I got this opportunity to go to what she called was the middle of nowhere in Canada or in the Midwest to go play hockey and go finish my high school there in my last two years, she said, no way, you're not doing it. She goes, you live in my house under my rules. You're not 18 yet. And uh, you're staying here, you're finishing school. And once you finish school, you do whatever the hell you want, but uh, you're doing this. Obviously there was some tense times in my household as a 16 year old <laughs> kid. I didn't understand it all. I disagreed with her. I thought she was the worst person in the world. Um, but 
now looking back on it, I think it was a smart decision because her whole point was, listen, I get it. You want to go live this dream, go play hockey. Unfortunately, we know you're not making it to the NHL. Okay, maybe you can go Division One in CAA, but you're going to be a 20, like I said, or 21-year-old freshman. You're going to delay the start of your life by three years. And at that time, I already knew that I wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to go to law school. So we knew I had four years of college and then three years of law school ahead of me. So she goes, you're going to start college at 21. That means you'll be an attorney at 28. You're going to delay yourself by three years. Why? To go live in the middle of nowhere and go play hockey and, you know, say I played Division One NCAA, but you're not going to go to the NHL. So obviously I stayed home. Um, I went to college out here. I played hockey out here in college. Uh, obviously, it's not the same as going out there, but I still had a great time. Uh, I thank my mom now because it was a good decision. Because I went to college at 18, graduated 22, was an attorney by 25. That wouldn't have happened if I went the other route. I would have been minimum 28 years old to start. Um, so I thank her for that, although I didn't at that time. Um, then I, uh, I graduated law school. I became uh, an attorney and I worked for this firm uh, out here in Irvine for five years doing kind of the exact stuff I do now. I focused on construction business, real estate, and uh, and insurance law. Um, so I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I got working at this firm because I learned a lot. Um, I was pretty new when I got into that opportunity. And my boss pretty much said, I'm going to throw you in the deep end of the pool and you either sink or you swim. And obviously it was, uh, it was really scary at that time because as I'm sure you all know in all of your different industries, but you know, being an attorney is definitely one of them. In law school, you don't learn anything about how to be an attorney. So just you come out, you pass the bar, you don't know a damn thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was uh, you know, thankful for that opportunity because it taught me how to actually practice law because law school passing the bar doesn't teach you any of that stuff. Um, so that uh, after working there for five years, that's when uh, I went, made the decision to go out on my own a couple of years ago. Uh, doing that same type of work again, business, real estate, construction, insurance. Um, then I think it was the end of 2021 or right around there. Since I focused my business on construction, uh, I started Googling whether there are some construction networking groups. I figured that'd be a great one to try to join. Found BTN online, uh, which was uh, really intriguing. Uh, I reached out to Paul, had a couple phone conversations with Paul. And at that time, we were still just on Zoom. We weren't in person. So Paul said, hey, hop on the Zoom, check it out, uh, you know, see if you like it. I did. Um, and it was great. And uh, honestly, one of the best decisions I've ever made, uh, especially for my business, was to join uh, this group. You guys uh, have all been wonderful to me, made some great connections, uh, and it means a lot to me to be a part of the group. So I'm so happy I did that. Paul, thank you very much. Um, so backtrack a little bit on why I wanted to become an attorney. It's also a personal family story. When I was a teenager, uh, like I said, my uh, one of my parents' businesses is they own ice rinks. Um, my dad had uh, his initial partners in his uh, business were two guys from Russia that played in the NHL. Um, one guy was a goalie, one guy was a player, and then they retired. My dad knew them and they became partners. Well, unfortunately, things kind of went sour between them, went south, got into a big business dispute. And as I'm sure all of you know, business disputes can get real ugly between partners. Um, so lawsuits were filed. Uh, everyone had attorneys. They're spending tons of money on attorney's fees. And every day I would come home from school and I would just see how stressed out my parents were every single day. This probably went on for over a year. And it was just every day, it was like, what's going to happen next? How much more money do we have to spend? And it was, it was just really ugly. And I, at that point, I felt, I felt so bad for them, obviously, because they're my parents, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, instinct to want to help them. But that made me, you know, and I started thinking, man, I, there's probably a ton of people out there who are experiencing these same issues, obviously very different areas of the law, but, uh, Let's be real. Usually, for the most time, when you need an attorney, it's not because it's something good. Uh, sometimes it is. Like I said, I draft contracts or help new businesses. Those, those are exciting things. But more often than not, it's, hey, I'm, I'm having this problem. Can you help me out? So uh, at that point, I kind of said, you know, made the decision. You know, I want to I want to try to help people. 
um, because legal issues are, are very, very complicated. Like I said, super stressful um, and people don't know what to do. So I said, you know, that this is what I want to do. I want to try to help people, um, you know, make them feel comfortable because sometimes these issues that, uh, you know, you hire an attorney for are some of the most important ones in your life. So I wanted to be that person uh, for my future clients. Um, so that's how I got the desire to go to law school and, uh, you know, made the jump and, and did that. Um, again, about my, my business, uh, with respect to my construction practice, that's definitely the largest part of my practice. Uh, and I say that I kind of do A to Z when it comes to construction, uh, just because, again, I've done it for, for a while. And that's from drafting and revising contracts to just making sure my clients are updated on current trends in the law, helping them with any employee issues, which unfortunately in California come up way too often, um, to helping them get paid on jobs, to helping them, like I said, with that difficult client, uh, if they're ever involved in any lawsuits relating to their work, I defend them. Um, so again, there, there might be some unique issues that come up within the realm of construction that, that I don't handle, you know, some specific stuff, but most of the stuff in construction I do, um, business and real estate, handle a lot of matters there. Insurance, like I've talked about, I help homeowners and business owners uh, with insurance claims that have either been denied or maybe they've been grossly underpaid or the insurance company is only covering a uh, small portion uh, of the claim. So I help them out with that. And then one part of my practice that I don't really talk about much, I don't advertise it much, um, but I do do it. I do have experience in it is uh, personal injury. So um, I'm not again that the billboard guy that got me, um, but uh, but listen, if, if you know anyone knows anybody who's ever been in an accident or slip and fall or anything like that, you know I I I can help them out. But again, it's not something that I necessarily advertise much. Um, so that is uh, a little bit about me. I uh, again I appreciate you guys letting me do this, and I wanted to again share a little bit more about myself and my background and my family because. We're all here, I think, as part of any networking group to build relationships. And the only way we build relationships is if we trust each other. And I don't know, my belief is in order to trust somebody, uh, you got to know a little bit more about them, not just come up here. All right, this is my business. This is what I do. I think, you know, probably want to know a little bit more about maybe a person's values, where they came from, so on and so forth. So I wanted to share that all with you. Uh, I know that I did not have any um PowerPoint slides or anything for you guys. And I apologize. I put the start of the year trials. It's been crazy. And I'm sure you talk to any attorney when they're in trial, it kind of consumes all your time. Um, so I, I wasn't able to do that. But either way, any PowerPoint presentation that I can uh, make up is uh, I'm sure not as exciting and visually appealing as a lot of you other can do because you know, what can an attorney do? I can put up some bullet points and all this stuff with all the contractors in here. You guys can show your cool projects. Like I know you showed your one in Fullerton like your last time you spoke and see some interesting stuff. I can't really do that. I can show you pictures of like my computer and the briefs that I draft, which is all going to be super boring for you guys. It wouldn't be visually appearing anyways. But uh, uh, I think that's all I wanted to share with you guys. Again, thank you very much. And uh, you know, happy to be a part of this group and let me know if you guys have any questions. Do you, do you have an, a, a likely outcome for a, a construction defect lawsuit where I provided service, but the owner is not my customer. It was subsequent purchasers of the property as is the customer, per, the, the new homeowner purchased the home and as is contract. Not my customer. I was the cus I was the servicing the real estate agent, and she is trying to come after me for a construction defect. Is there? It, she bought it as is. So she bought it. So the the real estate broker hired you to do to paint prior to sale. Okay. House was sold. Subsequently, three months later, came after me. Okay. Yeah. So that that's a stretch. I mean, <laughs> because she's trying to like jump the gun. I mean, normally, you know, in these lawsuits, you're going after this person that you have a contract with. If I hired you to do work on my house or my property and you screwed it up, 
obviously that's, you know, that's a strong case. Now here she's trying to go through the real estate broker and say, I know, I don't even know who this person is and you didn't know them. Um, you know, there was no contract between the two of you. Then, you know, I think it's a stretch. I mean, technically under the law, anyone can make a negligence claim against anyone because when someone is hired to do something, whether it's construction or whatever service it is, you have a duty under the law to, you know, act as a ordinary prudent person would in similar circumstances. So I guess in this situation, you have a duty to perform, you know, not defective paint work. Um, so it, I guess could be potentially, but I think in your case, you're sitting in a good position just because again, you were hired by the real estate broker. You had no contract, no relationship with that person. So I would say you're sitting in a pretty good position, but it is impossible for them to recover. No, it's not. Well, no, they can pay you. Peter? Paint's falling off. Uh, um, back to your business and what you do. Uh, are you in a good place size-wise for your company? Or do you, you said you've been in uh, in trial and litigation. So that consumes all your time. You have... Do you see yourself bringing on other attorneys? Do you see yourself growing? Or absolutely, yeah. So I I have support staff um, right now to to help me out. Um, you know, assistant paralegal. Um, so they definitely help me out. But uh, but yeah, certainly the goal is is to grow and, and yeah, hire associates. And so that's definitely um, you know the plan and, and going to happen for sure. Andy. What's the lead time to go to trial now? Oh, uh, it kind of depends where the case is venued. If you're talking L.A. County, uh, you know, you're talking a year and a half to two years. Uh, yeah, because L.A. Wow. County. Yeah, that's that's the thing is unless you've been familiar with litigation, which, again, hopefully people haven't because litigation is it's very expensive. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will say. Well, let's just sue them. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, you can sue somebody, but you file the lawsuit, your trial date is minimum, even in Orange County, it's not going to be a year out. That's a minimum. You go to LA, it could be a year and a half to two years out. Um, you know, like in LA, again, they're still backed up from COVID. So that's why LA, I, I had a case last week, we had a hearing, they set trial uh, for October of 2024. You know, so it, it, it's yeah. So the lead times, uh, I'd say minimum a year, but could be up to two years. Um, so that's why I always say, uh, you know, let's see. Uh, let's see if there are any other options other than litigation. It's expensive and it's lengthy and it's stressful. Um, but sometimes listen, it's uh, it's necessary. But saying that, I'd say ninety five percent of cases. They don't go to trial. They settle um, just because it's a myriad of factors. One is cost. Taking a case to trial is, is very, very expensive. Two is uh, uncertainty. Obviously, you know, you have either a jury trial where it's even more uncertain because you have, a, you know, 12 people in a box that are deciding your, your case. You never know what's going to happen. Sometimes it's a bench trial with a judge. But still, you have no idea. I mean, you could say, hey, I think we have a lot of really strong arguments. We're going to go on. We're going to put our evidence on. And But you have no idea what that could, you know, you could say, but a judge or a jury could choose one way or another. So you don't know. That's why when you settle a case, you have much more control over it. You're controlling the end outcome. Um, so, yeah, 95% of cases settle. But, you know, the small percentage do go to trial. Steve? Can you uh, explain the difference, like, between going to trial and mediation, why, how you can get people to do mediation. And is that a good idea? Cause it is in our contract. Um, I think mediation is a great idea unless the parties are just on different universes where one's asking for $10, one's saying 10 million, then it's like, you know, I don't know that it's going to be very effective, but if it's not in that situation, I most of the time recommend mediation difference is um, like I said, trial, you're going into court, yeah, same as an arbitration, arbitration not in court, it's an informal <laughs> proceeding, but both sides are making their arguments and somebody's making a decision on who wins. In trial, it could be a jury or a judge. In arbitration, it's an arbitrator, but they're choosing one side wins. Mediation is where both sides hire a, a common mediator and the mediator essentially puts you guys in two separate rooms 
and jumps back and forth of, okay, let's go to party one. What are your goals? What are you looking to achieve? Okay, let me take that to party two. Then you go to party two. This is what they want. What do you want? And just it's the mediator going back and forth, trying to bring the parties together to settle. And again, I recommend that always because if you settle the case, you know what the end result is. You're controlling it versus going to trial. You never know what's a jury going to do or it's a judge going to say or arbitrator. So, um, yeah, that's the main difference. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, who's your favorite hockey team? Ah, hockey <laughs> team, the, uh, the Kings, LA Kings. Yeah. Would be the, yeah. Although I, I know it's weird because uh, I'm growing up in Orange County, but uh, Traders. No, no, I don't know. Just Ducks fans. I don't know. Some of them, they, they bothered me. I think they still follow all the Disney Ducks movies. <laughs> They're not like real hockey fans. About exactly, you know, so that bothers me. But even though sometimes I wish it was to drive into Staples Center is a nightmare. But uh, but yeah, the Kings. Okay, cool. Are you still playing? You still get out? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I play, uh, you know, all for fun now. I, I play adult league um, and it's it's pretty cool. We have, so I have an older brother. He's eight and a half years older than me. Um, and our team is pretty much comprised of half my brother and his buddies and then half me and my buddies. And we played together for so long that now we're just all kind of, you know, friends. So it's cool. Once a week though, just for fun. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So. Do you and your brother body check each other pretty hard sometimes? Um, well, now we're on the same team, so we don't. But actually, a funny story on that. So my brother, it's like he was what, probably, you know, 12, 13 at the time. I was five or six. And, and my brother always wanted a little brother. And when I was born, he always told my mom, oh, perfect. I'm going to have someone to practice my body check. <laughs> my mom was like, no. But we had this long hallway in our house. And I was five. He was 13. And I looked up to him. I wanted to do any, everything that he wanted to do. And he convinced me. He's like, hey, Elon, I uh, I really need to practice my body checking. I need to get better. And I'm a five-year-old kid. I'm like, okay, sure. But he's, like, he's like, so you're going to run through this hallway at full speed. And I'm going to body check you in the wall. <laughs> and I was just like, I want to do everything he said. So I'm like, sure, let's do it. So I would do it. He would throw me through the wall. There'd be holes. And my mom would come home. What the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> That's what brothers are for. Exactly. That'll make it tough. For sure. Eli, that is a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great testimony. We're doing the plus home process in order to make the business grow. And one of the parts that needs to be reviewed is the contract. And hire Elon to review the contract and we're working together. He is super accessible guy and uh, is helping a lot. Just to, just to, just a testimony about his work. And I think you all could do that as well. And one last thing, I know it's not your business, but uh, in Torrance, there's a big sign say, put your name here, just in case. <laughs>